And a good Monday morning to you. It is Missional Monday. I pray you woke up as I know uh, Sister Vicki, uh, Brother Edward, uh, woke up ready to go thinking through theology. I pray that you woke up thinking through theology this morning. Matter of fact, Edward, you have a blog, uh, thinking through theology, edhowell.wordpress.com. Find your way over there. I promise you'll be blessed. This is the Preterist Power Hour. This is our time to go live where we join together for what we call an hour of power and uh, talk through theology. I'm your host, Mike Miano, and it's my privilege to be here with you. I serve as the director of the Power of Preterism Network, and this is a ministry provided to you through the Power of Preterism Network, which you can learn more about by visiting powerofpreterism.com. And uh, I also serve as the pastor of the Blue Point Bible Church. I was just sharing with our group here some praises from a fruitful weekend gathering with the saints. I pray that you found yourself gathering uh, with a few, uh, whether that be in your home, whether that be in someone else's home, whether that be uh, at an assembly or an institution called a church. Uh, however you, you work that out, I pray that you found yourself being blessed this weekend and uh, that you will continue to be blessed as you go through this week. That being said, let's go ahead and approach our Lord with proper prayer and praise. Mighty God, we do thank you. Lord, I thank you for the many ways that we've come to know you. Isaiah 9 tells us this beautiful truth that we can know you, Lord, as the wonderful counselor, as the everlasting father, as the mighty God, as the prince of peace. And in knowing you in these many ways, we can also know the truth of your kingdom your, or your government, Lord. The increase of your kingdom, your government knows no end. We, we relish our identity in that kingdom. We ask that you continue to give us opportunities to lift up sacrifice of praise. Also, of course, trusting you, Lord, lifting up petitions, whether it be petitions for our own lives, our loved ones, or uh, petitions that we might gain better understanding. Lord, give us wisdom. We lift all these things up to you, Lord. We thank you for being the God of answered prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So to jump right into things, uh, we've been falling back to Genesis. We have a blog uh, on our site, uh, Falling Back to Genesis. If you go to uh, powerofpreterism.wordpress.com, you can uh, gain access to that blog and a host of others. We've, we've had some great interviews. Uh, we have Brother Nick here with us uh, this morning. Nick was recently one of our interviews that we had. We had Dallas with us uh, recently. Uh, unfortunately, we're praying for Dallas. He's not here this morning. Uh, we've had Dallas from Better Understanding the Bible to give some context. If you go to YouTube, you definitely want to visit Better Understanding the Bible and gain access to Dallas's resources. You can find ways to do all of that and really find healthy study by going to powerofpreterism.wordpress.com and following the blogs and resources we've provided for you there. So um, yeah, again, think about the power of this program. We've, or we've just started, we're like three minutes in and I've already given you two resources that will, I promise you will bless your socks off to borrow that phrase. Uh, you have Edward's blog, uh, Thinking Through Theology, edhowell.wordpress.com. I believe we're going to be uploading, matter of fact, later today, uh, uploading another article, The Significance of AD 70, uh, The Distinction, The Distinct Judgment in AD 70. I promise you'll be blessed. You'll want to check out that article and better understanding the Bible with Dallas. You know, we've been laboring through Genesis, and I know personally I've used Dallas's YouTube as my sort of teaching, as my exhortations, uh, that which is driving me into the scriptures. So you'll be blessed by and by if you visit there. Uh, another resource that I'll bring up just to kind of precipitate our study this morning would be timmartinteaches.wordpress.com. That is a collection of the uh, sermons preached by Tim Martin. Uh, the, he used to preach at uh, Covenant Community Church in Whitehall, Montana, and uh, we were able to gain access to the sermons and upload them, which of course are the outworking of the Covenant Creation View, uh, which another fourth and final resource, I promise, would be the book Beyond Creation Science. There's a PDF file you can get for free online. We have a link to it at our website. You can uh, purchase the book and have a hard copy. So your hard copy could look as uh, messed up as mine does. And I say that in a good way because a man with a messed up book means he's studied through the book. Uh, that's a to borrow a quote there from Charles Spurgeon uh, where he said that, you know, a man with a messy Bible is a man that's life is not a mess. That's my paraphrase. However, uh, you know, a beautiful picture nonetheless. So Four resources I've already kind of put before you this morning. And I hope that you take some time to dive into those resources. 
Uh, I'm a resource junkie. Uh, that's me in uh, recovery, I guess, admitting my problem. Uh, a resource junkie where I love resources. So, you know, I'm always providing them. And that's namely our goal with the Preterist Power Hour is to really put a lot of these resources, to put some conversation, to put some thinking right in front of you. Because again, we're exhorted in 1 Thessalonians 5 to prove all things, to examine everything carefully. Hold fast to that which is good and abstain from that which is bad. So I pray that we've been a blessing in that regard. And if I might preface our study this morning, uh, I came up with a title and it's going to be Tall Dots. That's T-O-L-E-D-O-T-S, Tall Dots, Colophones. I'm not going to spell that one, Colophones, and Day 7. That's what we're going to look at here. We're going to get in on this conclusion of the seven days of creation in Genesis chapters 1 through 2. So uh, I hope you're excited uh, to dive in on that. We've, of course, continued at our Falling Back to Genesis resource. We've written our notes. I did upload last week's podcast. I had apologized for uh, cutting off our session abruptly. Uh, unfortunately, the time got the best of us there, and uh, uh, we had to end abruptly. However, we hope that we won't have to do that in the future. We're going to stick to the best, our best effort of an hour of power and uh, slate things that need further discussion for other times and allow that to happen. So um, I think we've done a great job. I want to just say I'm so appreciative to those of you that are here. Um, Brother Edward, Vicki, Zach, Nick, uh, of course, we're always appreciative for Dallas and his resources. Um, I'm appreciative because this has allowed me to revisit, to know all the truth that I do know at this point, which I'm constantly praising God that he just pours out wisdom. He's so faithful in that. If you ask him, he'll give it. So and by the way, that's James chapter one. So he gives this wisdom to us and he allows us to walk worthy of it. Perfectly, we're walking worthy of it. And, um, you know, so I say that because I'm so appreciative of our group. I'm so appreciative of, uh, you know, of the relearning. And that brings me to something I wanted to share with you uh, this morning. I, I did a devotional on our common prayer session and it talked about reading backwards. And as I read this, I thought, yeah, amen. This is this is something that I think needs to uh, bless others. So I just want to share with you briefly. Uh, this is the daily bread reading. It's called Reading Backwards. And they started with the verse, uh, John chapter 2, verse 22. Uh, after he was raised, his disciples recalled what he had said. Reading the last chapter of a mystery novel first may sound like a bad idea to those who love the suspense of a good story. But some people enjoy reading a book more if they know how it ends. In Reading Backwards, author Richard Hayes, which, by the way, is a great author. So uh, Richard Hayes, you want to write that name down. Uh, he has quite a few different books. Dr. Don K. Preston, who we've talked with, talked about quite a bit, uh, he often points to Richard Hayes's resources. So just to lift up a, a praise here, this is The Daily Bread. This is probably one of the most uh, you know, given out uh, devotionals across the world. And yet here they're talking about Richard Hayes. So I just want to highlight how beautiful that is. In Reading Backwards, author Richard Hayes shows how important the practice is for our understanding of the Bible by illustrating how the unfolding words and events of scripture anticipate, echo, and throw light on one another. Professor Hayes gives reason to read our Bibles forward and backward. Hayes reminds readers that it, it was only after Jesus's resurrection that his disciples understood his claim to rebuild a destroyed temple in three days. The apostle John tells us the temple he had spoken of was his body, John 2, 21. It was only then that they could understand a meaning of their Passover celebration that they never understood before. Only in retrospect could they reflect on how Jesus gave fullness of meaning to an ancient king's deep feelings for the house of God. Only by rereading their scriptures in light of the true temple of God Jesus himself, could the disciples grasp how the ritual of Israel's religion and Messiah would throw light on one another. And now, only by reading these same scriptures backward and forward, can we see in Jesus everything that any of us has ever needed or longed for. And they say here, uh, the prayer, the closing prayer was, Father in heaven, thank you for letting me live long enough to see your ability to show up and reveal the wonder of your presence in ways I could not have foreseen. And prayerfully, you find yourself saying amen to that this morning. Two things I have to note. The first, on a scriptural level, on a biblical, reading the Bible biblically level, if you will, uh, 
would be the importance of reading forward and backward. So as I was mentioning, I read the Bible forward all the time. Here on our program, we read the Bible forward, right? We, we, we learn, we continue to learn. Uh, but then we also notice, and we do this in our studies, where we'll go backward. We'll say, well, as a Christian, this is the way that through Christ and the apostles and apostolic interpretation, we've come to understand these things in the Old Testament. So that's kind of reading backward. And as I was mentioning, uh, all of you that are here in our session, uh, all of you that question things on Facebook and stir conversation with me, you help me read backward. You help me exercise this exact reality, uh, you, you know, to think through Genesis, if you will, uh, by understanding the true revelation. And uh, it's such a blessing. Uh, so I have so much to say about this reading backward thing, but I'll mention one more point or two more points for that matter. Uh, the next point I would bring up would be in life, as this devotional was pointing out on an applicational way where we can go through life. And, you know, I happen to believe we learn different truths at the times the opportune times God wants to teach them to us. So I do believe that we should be moving forward in our life, but also God is sometimes bringing us backward. As I've mentioned publicly here, uh, you know, for me, this looking at Genesis and understanding the terms, understanding as Dallas has brought out this covenant template and how these terms are used all throughout the biblical literature and the biblical narrative uh, is something I've been more recently opened up to. And I know I'm blessed by it all, uh, nonetheless. Another thing I have to mention that I've taught before uh, would be in understanding Genesis, and this will kind of be our launch into uh, Genesis this morning. Um, in understanding Genesis, the best way to understand what's going on in Genesis 1 through 3 would be to start at the end of Genesis at, what is that, uh, Genesis chapter 49, I believe. Uh, is that the last chapter? Let me open up my Bible. I encourage you to do the same this morning. Our last chapter of Genesis would be shows you I haven't read to the end of Genesis in quite some time, it would be chapter 50. Uh, but we also know the reason why I bring up 49 is that is Israel's prophecies regarding the last days. So you see the pointing to the end right there in Genesis chapter 49. The best way to understand what's going on in the end of the Bible is to understand what's going on in the beginning. And the best way to understand what's going on in the beginning is to understand what's going on in the end. Hopefully that works with you there. So I want to encourage you, read your Bible forward, backward, sideways, uh, however you can, and uh, gain the truths that God's, uh, you know, trying to teach you. Matter of fact, that reminds me of a teaching I taught a couple of years ago. I talked about shaking and squeezing the scriptures. I remember I gave a little bit of humor to this where I mentioned uh, it's sort of like catch up. Me, uh, those of you that know me know I will use something to the last drop. I will save it, save it, save it, and use it. I don't want anything to go wasted. So uh, one of the things I thought of and I taught about was uh, taking the catch up bottle and I treat my Bible like this. I, I take the ketchup bottle, put a little bit of water in it and shake it up and make sure I get, you know, squeeze it a little bit, get all the, the rest of the uh, ketchup that's in the bottle, get the most out of it. And that's, I, I talked about shaking and squeezing the scriptures. And I believe that's so important to really just constantly be going back, reviewing, never have this attitude that, well, now I know. Might I say that's probably one of the worst realities to come to is now I know all things. Uh, now I don't need to read the Bible anymore. I don't need to go back to Genesis chapters one through three in light of the things I've come to understand because I already understand what Genesis one through three is talking about. Let's shake our head in dismay at that this morning. That's not a good way to go about studying the Bible. And I know, unfortunately, some that have done that. So just wanted to uh, challenge you in that regard. So we've been journeying through Genesis one. And again, I want to encourage you, visit our resource site, and uh, you'll definitely be blessed in that regard. Um, we've provided notes, we've provided resources, uh, we've mentioned more and more resources that you can go about. And last, on Friday, uh, last session, we ended our study at verse, we moved in on day six, and we talked about uh, the beast of the earth. Uh, God saw that it was good on the sixth day, verse 31 is ultimately our conclusion of last week. Uh, Dallas blessed us with uh, some thoughts uh, that he had been going through. And again, I want to encourage you. Uh, that's where I'm at, personally, if I might be transparent here, is I'm re-looking at Genesis 1 through Dallas, uh, better understanding the Bible's uh, resources there, you, you know, going through the videos and relearning. So I, I encourage you to do the same. And also, as we'll move in on Genesis 2, as I've mentioned, I've been using Tim Martin sermons to better exhaust my thoughts in that regard. So um, I thought we brought out some great points uh, in 
Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 through 31, as this being a covenant template, a covenant document, something that stands alone. We did have quite a bit of conversation, and unfortunately, the session ended abruptly in talking about the image of God. I think we can all agree here. There's a lot going on, and Dallas said this even you know, himself. There's a lot going on in day six. There's a lot that needs to be talked about. Uh, hopefully, if you've looked at our review, we've provided uh, areas for further study. There's no way that we're going to get in, let's say, um, let's, well, let's just look at this here for a moment. I want to bring your attention to verse 26. So this is day six that we're talking about here. And notice what it says. It says, let us make man in our image. That sentence right there has brought about hosts and hosts of theological disagreement, theological perspectives, just the two words, let us. That's brought, that brings up conversations about oneness. That brings up conversations about the Trinity. Uh, as we know, we've talked with Dallas a bit about his views on Jesus, and uh, there are a variety of different views out there. So that alone has continued to be a 2,000-year dialogue and discussion, debate, if you will. We are, we're not going to solve that in an hour program. So uh, for me, I have marked it out as an area of contention and further study. I hold to the view of the Trinity, and uh, I you know, I find that substantiated in the areas that I need it to be, uh, all the while giving people liberty not to necessarily agree with me. And I know for some, that's a big problem. They're like, well, then that's, it might not even be the same God. That's fine. That's fine. Uh, I'm not going to get into those discussions. I don't believe I'm a know-it-all. One thing I will say, uh, as I mentioned in our program last week, a good cross-reference to Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 would be Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 20. We see an apostolic interpretation of those points. Let us make man in our image, according to the likeness, according to our likeness. Again, you notice the plurality of the word. Uh, that's brought up so many different conversations. Uh, let them rule over the fish of the sea. Now, this dominion thing, this is another area of conversation. So if we're talking about man ruling over the, the fish of the sea, the beasts of the earth, and we've talked about this being terms of Gentiles and people in the land, uh, you know, and let's call, let's say this as well. This constant distinction of Jew and Gentile that most people are familiar with, however, we've made it to, uh, we almost have brought that to bear upon everything. There were other divisions. If you remember, it says uh, neither slave nor Scythian, male nor female, uh, Jew or Gentile. So there are all these different uh, titles that are brought into this conversation that need to be considered. And, um, you know, so I, as I've mentioned, I'm already, I'm still in this process of learning, relearning uh, the language that's being used here in Genesis 1. The only folks that I have a disdain toward uh, in this regard would be those that say, oh, well, we already know what it means and are not welcoming conversation. Uh, moving further, uh, the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, these are phrases that need to be outlined. So this is, we haven't even gotten through verse 26 yet. Hopefully you catch my point. There's a lot to be exhausted here and there's some great resources. Uh, I've mentioned Tim Martin's stuff, Dallas's stuff and uh, Don Stoner's stuff, Jeff Vaughn's uh, teachings. Uh, they're just, and hopefully what we'll, see, we'll continue to see, excuse me, is more and more teachings pop up, more and more folks with blogs and resources uh, that we can point people to and other discussions that are building on what we're doing here on the Preterist Power Hour. We notice that uh, man is given dominion here. This image of God is given dominion uh, in verse 26. And then uh, we read, of course, he created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. I find that to be an interesting col colophone, colophone, if you will, probably saying the word wrong. However, if you were to do the research, uh, a colophon is in a signature. It's a way of signing a document. Now, I believe that there's some evidence to this being an ancient Near Eastern colophon, not necessarily verse 27, maybe, uh, because there is that sort of repetition that you'll see as well in verse four of chapter two. Uh, so there might be something there that maybe needs to be better uh, understood. However, for the time, uh, I will say that, again, we just see a repetition there of um, God making man in his own image. And then we notice verse 28, he blessed them. God said, be fruitful and multiply. Uh, another covenant phrase that needs to be understood because if we remember the fish of the sea and the birds of the air were told to be fruitful and multiply as well. Fill the earth, subdue it, rule over the fish in the sea. There's that dominion uh, picture again. And every living thing that moves on earth. Then God said, I have given you every great green plant uh, that it for seed that is on the surface of all the earth and every tree which has fruit yielding seed and it shall be good for food and here this gets me in on tree language which i've been welcoming a lot of conversation about and understanding 
uh, even if talking yesterday with my wife about God seeing men walk as trees, uh, you know, something interesting there, or um, excuse me, uh, when Jesus healed the man and the man said, I see men walking as trees, um, might have given up my interpretation of that uh, just now. Uh, however, I do believe there's something there that hasn't maybe been exhausted uh, best. So then you get into verse 30, you got the beast of the earth, the bird of the sky again, uh, you know, every green plant for food, and it was good. And there was evening, there was morning, the sixth day, verse 31. I kind of went through that to highlight the fact that there's a lot going on there. There's a lot just in that small portion that needs to be exhausted. And I hope that with us here, what you've been doing is just writing little subheadings. And maybe you'll email me, maybe you'll let me know. These are conversations that need to be exhausted. So Mike, I get you want to go through day one through seven, which we're going to conclude today. Now moving forward, and I'm speaking to myself third party, uh, as we move forward, I hope that we might, someone might email me and say, well, we need to talk about the image of God, which many of you know, I've already slated for discussion. Um, we need to talk about this. We need to talk, and, and due to you saying that, we can set up a program right on that topic. So uh, please know that I'm, I'm asking for that. And uh, if you have any thoughts, please email me and let me know uh, what you might be thinking. So uh, that's what I have uh, for this portion. What I'm going to do is unmute the mics and we're gonna move in on chapter two verses one through four. However, before we do that, I will uh, allow everyone to uh, share a thought or two. Um, keep in mind we're, we're keeping this to an hour. So, uh, you know, we want to, I want to, of course, hear your thoughts. Uh, I want to have you summarize what you're studying through. And if you have more exhaustive thoughts, I want to encourage you to email me uh, or text me, call me, however you find communication with me. So uh, before we get in on chapter two, I'll unmute. Let me know what you're thinking up to this point, And then we will journey into the next four verses. I may be mistaken, but I, I thought I read at one point where when it said, may God in our image, rather um, a man will become like us, you know, um, as a result of what they've done eating through the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And, he, and God said, you know, he, they, they, they may become like us. I thought I read at one point where it said angels as well. Um, I may be mistaken at that point, because if that is the case, then that's, that's probably who you were speaking to, the host of the angels. But I, I haven't found that uh, where it said angels, but I thought I read that someplace. Well, what you're doing is you're, you're combining a couple of texts here. So we have yes. what we're reading here in Genesis 1 about the image of God, let us make man in our image. And then what you're noticing is when they ate of the tree, which is going to be in chapters two and three, when yes. they said the tree, that's where they said, now man has become like one of us. Yes. Knowing good and evil. Yes. And then uh, what was the last thing you had said? That was a combination of. Um, I thought I read in there somewhere like <clears throat> when, it, when he said they would be like one of us. And, and, and then I thought I saw angels in there, you know, uh, at one I point. Thought, yeah. So that might be a combination of Philippians 2. Uh, where we read that Jesus became a little lower than the angels. And a lot of people have posited that's talking, you know, that what they say about us and how that relates to humanity. I would say that, that you know, you're, you're combining a couple of different things. Um, let's just consider that then. So you're saying that the one true God talked to the angels and he said, let's make them like us. And what does that mean? And who, who are we talking about? Let, let's make them who? Adam and Eve, all humanity, you see what I'm saying? There's a lot that can go into that conversation. So, but that's why that's why when we talk about reading backwards and stuff like that, <clears throat> we know that um, God has a particular people. You know uh, that he that he would show himself through. So I would think I I would suggest that that he's referring to when he says make them like us, the mind of us, like, you know, given the mind of God, uh, a way of thinking other than the, use, the uselessness, the, the chaotic or the way of innate uh, thinking uh, on their own accord, instead of that thinking the way of God, you know, putting God first. I don't know if I'm explaining it, you know. Well, I appreciate what you did highlight, and I'm not going to keep us here because, again, what the point is, is that's the way you think about it. That's the um, way. You know, what uh, 
I will say is we see the image of God here. And I do appreciate that you brought up the reading backwards. Uh, I do think that applies. Um, so I would say receive Edward's exhortation in that regard. Highlight this image of God conversation and maybe go to the end of the Bible and ask yourself, what does the end of the Bible reveal about God's image and people that were created in his image? And how would that bear upon what we're reading here in Genesis chapter one? So thank you, Edward. I, I can definitely agree with that. Um, if I might ask you, uh, and I want to encourage anyone that wants to unmute to uh, jump in, uh, Edward, since I have you here, uh, so how are you following along with days one through six? Uh, if somebody was to ask you, can you just give me a very brief summary here? What is Genesis days one through six talking about? What is this? Okay, let me, let me just go to Genesis one. Um, well, I believe it's talking about how in the beginning God created a, a, a people. And, um, and, and, and a relationship, a covenant with them, you know? Uh, and then it speaks of- uh, to that, give me a proof for that. Why do you believe it's talking about people? It says, Edward, are you reading your Bible, brother? It says in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Why are because, you talking about people? Because in this particular context, in the Bible, like, okay, with Moses, when he, when he was talking talking to, to Israel, he said, listen here, O heaven and earth. Ah. So he, he uses that term to, re, to, to speak to his people. That's right. Okay, I follow that. So you're saying heaven and earth is a phrase used to talk about people rather than the physical terra firma that I'm standing upon and the thing I see up when I look up. Yes. Okay. All right. The language of the scripture, that's, that's what we need to uh, learn. That's right. Amen. And, and so you're seeing the same thing that we've been outlining here, just to further exhaust your thought, that this is a template of phrases and terms that we probably should mark out and see how they follow through in the rest of the Bible. Amen. Amen. Good deal. All right. Well, and I can appreciate that. I think you're on the, obviously I wanted to be a bit facetious there and kind of, you know, uh, see where, how you would respond to somebody that might be a bit more contentious about these things. And I think you're starting on a great foundation. So I'm glad you're, you're seeing these truths as well. I don't see anyone necessarily unmuting. So I'm going to just give us the liberties to be here. And, and if you want to unmute and join in, you're more than welcome. Uh, Edward, I'm going to go ahead and put Genesis 2 verses 1 through 7 on the screen. And I'm going to bring us through the reading. And then uh, we'll have some conversation as we've been doing around the topic there. Genesis 2. Look at that. It took us two weeks to get into Genesis 2. We're doing all right. <laughs> uh, you know, but again, hopefully you know that that's the point is to exhaust our, our study here. So I'm reading out of the NASB. I'm going to put it on the screen for your. Okay, here we go. So we noted that the creation of male and female, uh, the image of God was on day six. And now you notice, uh, and ended right there at verse 31. Now here in chapter two, we read, thus the heavens and the earth were completed and all their hosts. By the seventh day, God completed his work, which he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because he rested from all his work which God had created and made. This is the account of the, excuse me, of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made earth and heaven. So obviously, as you notice, you read through verses one through four, it's like, well, they just said the same thing four times. You know, you see some key themes. And if I might just bring these up, as I've been doing here in our discussion, just some key points to mark out in your study. Um, the seventh day. And again, I want to hold us to that hermeneutic of the, uh, the reading backwards this morning, because again, most of us know seventh day language is used all throughout the Bible, uh, the Sabbath, uh, what this becomes known as. So we see here, God takes his sabbatical. He rests, he reign rests and rules uh, in that which he has created. And as Edward just marked out, uh, heaven and earth here uh, need not make us think of physical things, but rather of well, humanity and his covenant with these people heaven and earth. Uh, God is now merging heaven and earth where he can be present with his people. And of course, uh, 
heaven and earth is a term that needs to be continually taught upon. Uh, then we also see and their hosts, which Edward marked out the discussion about angels. Uh, that has brought up quite a bit of conversation for folks. What does it mean, heaven, earth, and their hosts? I'm still currently studying through that and developing my understanding. Uh, rest is important here. Uh, that's the, you know, if you were to mark out heaven and earth, uh, the seventh day, the hosts, rest would be your fourth one that you would write down. And I believe a rest is not the slothful laziness that we call resting. I don't think anyone in the ancient world would have called what most people today called rest, rest. They'd call that, no, that seems like dysfunction, um, not rest. Rest is when you've accomplished something, you're accomplishing something. And as I mentioned, you're reigning and ruling in it. Um, some quotes I'll share. Uh, the gospel according to the Hebrews, uh, interesting text to be reading currently in our uh, study at the Blue Point Bible Church, where in the second century, and the gospel according to the Hebrews was one of the writings that was actually read by early Christians and encouraged to be read. And in that writing, we read, to the one who is amazed will rule. The one who rules will find rest. I believe it's getting in on the concept there of the fulfilled covenant and being amazed in awe at Jesus Christ, setting our eyes on Jesus as the author and finisher of our faith. Another note, I'll share this link, by the way, on our, uh, our, our resource link. Um, Another study talks about uh, recent studies of divine rest in Genesis 1. Note convincingly that the concept is connected with God's rule from his cosmic temple or enthronement of God in his cosmic temple for the purpose of his rule. How beautiful is that? That's what we're talking about here. We've been talking about this whole thing as a temple text of God taking up his rule among his covenant people, them being his image, if you will. And, uh, you know, so this language really does kind of uh, wrap it up for us uh, in day seven. And uh, that being said, day seven is complete, right? Many of us know Hebrew gematria would mark out day seven as a number of completion based upon what we're reading here in Genesis chapter two, verses one through four. I will provide the link to that study about the ancient Near Eastern concept of divine rest. And I might also mention uh, a couple of things I might want to conclude with here would be um, the language of the seventh day, I'll remind you, seventh day temple texts were popular in the ancient Near Eastern world. You can find the Enuma Elish, a seven day creation text, talking about a Marduk, the god Marduk, and, and you know, how they understood that. And we've, uh, Edwards mentioned this before, um, Ray Vanderlaan, a resource we've been studying through uh, that the world may know, he gets in on a lot of this ancient insights of the temple and how, they, you know, how idols were made and then the ceremonial practices of the idol representing the God. And that's ultimately what we're seeing happen right here in Genesis chapter one. A uh, last thing I'll mention for a moment, and then Edward, if you wanna jump in and share some thoughts, would be uh, in verse four, we read uh, some important things, two things that, uh, two terms I wanna teach you this morning and highlight. This is the account of the heavens and earth when they were created. Okay, uh, that phrase right there is what we would call a tall dot. And why do I say that? Because account of the heavens and earth is also translated the generations of the heaven and earth. And when you do research on a tall dot, which by the way, if you're doing the Parshat readings with the Jewish community this week, guess what the Parshat's called? Tall dot. So uh, interesting. Uh, so as I was reading to the Parshat's, I was like, wow, this is great. It correlates right to what we're talking about. A tall dot is a historical genealogy it's so that's what we're reading are we not reading the generations of the heavens and the earth this is the very beginning of the covenant people so keep that word in mind a tall dot these are the generations of heaven and earth a matter of fact i'll share a quick quote with you in genesis 2 4 by the way this is from don stoner i've mentioned dstoner.net a great website that you want to get your hands on in genesis 2 4 we encounter the phrase these are the generations of the heaven and earth when literally in that day they were created. The relatively modern Hebrew word for generations is the plural feminine form of birth or bringing forth. Since it comes at the end of the description of the heaven and earth, of the creation of the heaven and earth, it is where a Sumerian colophon, second word you're gonna to wanna to learn this morning, taldot and colophon, it is where a Sumerian colophon would belong. If this were the vestigial remains of an ancient Sumerian text, the colophon would identify and date the text. 
which is exactly what it does. Both the ownership these written, of these written symbols are the children of the heavens and earth. And dating in that day when they were created are both present. So we have an ancient Near Eastern text telling us about the genealogy of the covenant people. In Genesis 2.4, it is in the day that the Lord God made the heavens and earth. So the next tablet's tagline is still visible in the modern English version. In fact, apparent colophones and accompanying taglines, to borrow that phrase, are found repeatedly through the first and oldest parts of Genesis. Clear examples are seen in Genesis 5.1, Genesis 10.1. In both cases, the colophones appear to belong to the immediate preceding text. Even though it appears that those who added the chapter breaks tried to tag them to the beginning of subsequent texts. For more details, there's a great book that's out, I might get my hands on it, by Weissman, and it's called Ancient Records and Structure of Genesis, a Case for Literary Unity. So tall dots and colophones. Uh, a tall dot is the historical record. A colophone is an ancient signature. And that allows me to just complete my thought by a rereading of verse four, Genesis chapter two, verse four. This is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created. Taldot, in the day that the Lord God made heaven and earth. See how it's repeating the same phrase there, same thing, telling you nothing new. And again, we know that we might be taking a couple liberties here because we know the verses didn't exist uh, as this was sort of a paragraph. Uh, so there are some, we might want to break it up a little bit further up, um, you know, because again, two and four, two through four is sort of repetition. So that basically two through four would be our colophon telling us this is the end of a document and the beginning of a new document. That's what I'm seeing. Edward, what are your thoughts? When we were discussing uh, the Sabbath and God's rest, um, it led me to uh, Hebrews 4, 1 and verse 3, where it talks about, therefore, we must um, uh, fear it uh, while a uh, promise remains of entering his rest. Uh, Any one of you may uh, seem to have come short of it. And then verse three, um, the second portion says, um, which, which is highlighted, which is, must be in the Old Testament. But anyway, it says, um, they, certain, they certainly shall not enter my rest although his works was finished from the foundation of the world. So uh, Israel's hope was to enter into God's rest because during his rest, as we highlighted, he's, um, he's ruling and reigning and uh, they wanted to enter into his rest where they would rule and reign with God forever. Amen. That, that's, that is the goal, right? That's our rest is to rule yeah. and you're doing a good job of reading backwards because you're noticing the language that's happening here is found in Hebrews chapter four. So I think that's a beautiful citation uh, to bring up there uh, in regards to what, we're, what we just read, amen. Yes. So you're following along with this, uh, this narrative here and you see, do you, do you agree that this is a good conclusion to this ancient Near Eastern, uh, let's say perspective or this document uh, covenant template? Yes, and, and I like the two words that you had used, uh, told that, um, the 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 gene not the genealogy but yes. the beginning the genealogy you're correct the generations would be the uh, way it would be interpreted okay. some okay. translations do that okay the generations and the other word was colophon for the uh, historical signature yes okay. yeah I went ahead and I I googled it just to you know obviously you want to make sure you're doing research and I looked up uh, what is the definition of a colophon and it is a publisher's emblem or imprint, especially one on the title page or the spine of a book. Now that's a more contemporary uh, way of looking at it. However, in the ancient Near East, their way of doing a colophon was to end a sentence and then to basically repeat that sentence. So it could be noticed, you know, again, like a puzzle, like, oh, that fits there, <laughs> you know, that fits there. And, and that's how they would take these documents, or maybe let's say that's how Moses would have taken these documents and compiled what we've come to know as the beginning parts of the book of Genesis. 
So would this be qualified as a telephone when um, Paul writes in his letters? Uh, however, he would, you know, uh, give his name, hit him, Theophilus, or whoever he's with. That way, that they that they know it's from him. Uh, yeah, like his signature. Yeah, again, in a different context because we know in the ancient Near East, there's a different way of writing. We're talking what thousands of years prior, you, you know, whereas yeah. in the time of the first century, yes, you're, you're correct. That would have been a colophone the way that Paul says, you know, hi, it's me, Paul, writing from Colossae, et cetera, et cetera. Yes, okay. Good Good point there. Um, there was something else you mentioned that I, I oh man, um, it's escaping oh. my, you know. You was, it a, was it about the rest? Yeah, but I feel I've exhausted my thoughts in that regard. So I won't, I'm probably not going to come to me. Okay. Um, and I might mention, uh, I'm glad Edward brought up Hebrews 4. Uh, some other correlating text I would bring up would be uh, Exodus 20. We see that seventh day language is incorporated in what? The law of Moses, the Ten Commandments, if you will. And then in John chapter 5, if you don't mind, I'm going to take us over to John chapter 5 for just a brief moment. I'm going to read to us verses 1 through 17. After these things, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is a Jer in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethsaida, having five porticos. In these lay a multitude of those who were sick, blind, lame, and withered, waiting for the moving, moving of the waters. For an angel of the Lord went down at a certain season into the pool and stirred up the waters. Whoever then first, after the stirring of the water, stepped in was made well from whatever disease he was afflicted. And a certain man was there who had been 38 years in his sickness. When Jesus saw him lying there, he knew that he already had been for a long time in that condition. He said to him, do you wish to get well? The sick man answered him, sir, I have no man to put me in the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I'm coming, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, arise and take up your pallet and walk. And immediately the man became well and took up his pallet and began to walk. Now it was on the Sabbath day. Therefore, the Jews were saying to him who was cured, it is not, it is the Sabbath and it is not permissible for you to carry your pallet. But he answered them, he who made me well was the one who said to me, take up your pallet and walk. They asked him, who is the man who said to you, take up your pallet and walk? But he who was healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had slipped away while there was a crowd in that place. Afterward, Jesus found him at the temple and said to him, behold, you have become well. Do not sin anymore so that nothing worse may befall you. The man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. And for this reason, the Jews were persecuting Jesus because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. But he answered them, my father is working until now. And I myself am working. So uh, I know some that have offered up that this is the, Jesus is the divine rest. He is the, the to understand God's work and to understand um, Christ's work as our true rest, as Edward marked out there in Hebrews chapter four. Uh, here's the teaching that Hebrews four, in my opinion, would be based upon what we're reading right here in John five, one through 17, um, that my father is working until, until now and I myself am working. Uh, this is the, you know, and Jesus is the Sabbath. Uh, so again, it's in my mind, this language is talking about rulership. My father is reigning until now, and I myself am reigning. I myself am ruling. Uh, through what? Through his messianic ministry. So uh, for me, it just brings up an uh, interesting conversation. There's a lot in the New Testament that obviously speaks to the Sabbath, but I just thought that was a, that's one of my proof texts uh, for uh, what we're reading there on the seventh day in Genesis 2. I want to give opportunity. I know uh, Zach and Vicky are here with us, so I want to just see if they want to unmute and uh, welcome some conversation. Zach, I see you're unmuted. Hey, good morning, everyone. Um, yeah, I don't uh, have, I, I guess it, it, this just makes me think of um, this Sunday was Christ the King Sunday, um, which in the Western church, it's, it's the end of the liturgical year. Um, and it's the celebration of Christ ruling and reigning 
And, um, and again, at, it leads into what begins the beginning of the liturgical season, which is uh, Christ's birth and the light entering into the world. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it just, I don't know that I have any, you know, exegetical thoughts on it, but I mean, Christ is our Alpha and our Omega. He's in um, the days of creation from beginning to end, and it speaks of him. And it speaks of, you know, entering into his rest and um, par participating in that kingly reign um, in him. So I, that's just my thoughts on it. Amen. Yeah, again, you're guilty of reading backwards, Zach. Um, you know, uh, that's great, you, you know, uh, that you're, you're seeing those truths and how, you know, we do, we need to really understand the beginning of these things by, under, you know, by understanding the end and vice versa. Um, and I think that's beneficial, as you're pointing out, it's even beneficial in just, you know, narrowing it down to look at, let's say, the incarnation of Christ and ultimately his glorification. And, you, you know, that that obviously leads in on conversations we've talked about with preterism, where, you know, we're saying, well, he came into the world and then he ascended into glory. And, you, you know, I, obviously, you probably know where I'm going with that, Zach. I never understand where it's like, well, he has to have a physical body now. And I'm like, did he have a physical body before? you know, I, I don't understand. I thought he put on flesh and came into this world. So for me, it is a good, you know, okay, well, this is what you're saying about the end. So then let's go back and see how that works with, let's say, starting with the incarnation. So uh, what was the point of the incarnation if Jesus already existed in a body in heaven? Uh, you know, and, and that just, again, it opens up a Pandora box of confusion for me um, and conversation because I'm, I understand where some might say, well, yeah, he had an identity, he had a body and then he put on a, a human body, an earthly body, and then put off that earthly body and then ascended back into heaven. However, as most of you know, that begins to bring up strange questions about resurrection, et cetera. So just to kind of keep it simple, I would agree with you, uh, Zach, that, you know, that is a healthy way to read our Bible is to constantly be what we're understanding as we're celebrating Christ glorified. Let's go back and understand Christ incarnated and, and see how that works through our understanding. So Thank you. Amen. Thanks. Well, uh, you know, unless Vicki has something she wants to enter in on, I think we did a good job of uh, looking at this text. And again, you know, our goal here is to be foundational and provide resources for you to continue to develop your understanding. And maybe, God willing, you'll want to start a blog. You'll want to start a YouTube channel. And maybe you have some thoughts that build on top of what we're saying. Then we encourage you. We bless you to go ahead and start a resource that we might point back to. As many of you know, we talked a bit last week about debates. Um, I, I'm in the middle of a, some discussions about debate on Genesis. I have some, if you only knew, my inbox is filled up with people arguing with me about what we're teaching. And let me not, let me back that up. You know, I don't, I don't want to seem, to, uh, there's more people agreeing with us than disagreeing. However, there are some that disagree. And my social world experience, at least. And um, that being said, uh, I don't devalue that. I don't devalue questions. I, you know, I think that's a great thing. And I think if you have questions and you want to kind of lean in on these studies, by all means, email me, message me, start your own YouTube channel or blog, and you can help us further exhaust our understanding of these things. Uh, may I say yeah. John 5, 17, it just demonstrates that on the Sabbath, God and uh, Jesus, the, uh, he's not idle. Right. That's right. That was my, you know, I, I'm glad you mentioned that, Edward. That was my initial reason for marking out that verse was it proves that the point we're making about the reigning and resting and ruling, you know, that it's not a lazy, apathetic uh, style of uh, rest, but rather a rest that, you know, is God's rulership, God's reigning in his creation. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Well, again, I, and there's a host of resources. What I might encourage you to kind of conclude our program today would be to visit or Google, uh, go to Google and put in divine rest. And if you want, you know, some really good resources, maybe put in divine rest, ancient Near East, and, you know, begin mulling through some of these things about day seven that are revealed through ancient Near Eastern understandings. And I trust you'll be blessed. Or if you, you maybe you shake your head at that type of study and you say, I only want to stick to the Bible. Well, that's great. Mark out the seventh day language. 
and go through the whole Bible. Look at texts such as what we just marked out there in John 5, Hebrews 4, and, and see how this language is being understood and then say, well, then how would that bear upon my understanding or how would that bless my understanding of Genesis chapter 2, verses 1 through 4? I'm thankful for you being here. I do have some unfortunate news that we will not go live on Friday morning. Uh, so this week, uh, I am taking liberties to maybe let you know in the next day or two, if there are any interviews or resources, keep your eye on our blog site, powerofpreterism.wordpress.com, especially falling back to Genesis blog, because we're continuing to update. I'll be mentioning some of the things I mentioned here this morning, I'll be providing on that blog later today. And, um, and I pray that you continue to seek, search, study, improve to the best of your ability. I'm not aware of any uh, preterist conferences or anything that's happening in the next couple of days. Uh, as many of us know, we find ourselves here in the United States celebrating Thanksgiving uh, this coming Thursday. So I pray, of course, you have a happy, healthy, and hearty uh, Thanksgiving uh, with those that you're gathered around, that you might find yourself eating some food that you maybe haven't eaten throughout the year, uh, that you'd mark it out as a time to lift up Thanksgiving. And uh, here at the Blue Point Bible Church, we have a pre-Thanksgiving thanks on Wednesday night at 7 p.m. if you're local. We encourage you to join out. Matter of fact, I might work out a way where we could even be joined by what we often call our online community. Uh, so uh, we'll let everyone know about that in a day or two as well. And uh, prayerfully, this week continues to bless you, and especially pertaining to things we've unearthed uh, here in regards to Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 through Genesis 2, verse 4. Thank you for being here with me. I'm going to go ahead and conclude with our of closing benediction of the common prayer that I pray on uh, Monday mornings. And if I'm, before I do that, I just want to leave you with this quote from David Shilton. But if these opening chapters of the Bible are a revelation of God's relation to the world, may they not be apocalyptic in character? Is it not fitting that the canon of scripture should open as well as close with an apocalypse? Consider the powerful thoughts there of David Shilton. Uh, and if you visit the interview we had with Dallas, we actually have two resources from David Shilton free on PDF file for your edification. Thank you for being here. May the peace of the Lord Christ go with you wherever he may send you. May he guide you through the wilderness, protect you through the storm. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders that he has shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing once again into our doors. God bless, go in peace, and I look forward to journeying further in on God's garden, Genesis chapter two, in weeks to come. Go in peace.